at Milton Baptist Church. And also, if you're joining, we welcome you on behalf of Heron Cross uh, at uh, Blurton Baptist Church. And uh, we're glad to have you with, our, with you in our service this morning. Uh, just to remind you that next Sunday, our services will resume in person again at 9.30 and 11 a.m. and we'd love to have you come along and join with us if you can. We are again in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 10, Ecclesiastes chapter 10, and we're going to read just three verses of scripture to begin with this morning, Ecclesiastes chapter 10 verses 1 to 3. Let's read together, shall we, in Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Solomon writes, Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savour. So doth a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honour. A wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart at his left. Yea, also when he that is a fool walketh by the way, his wisdom faileth him, and he saith to every one that he is a fool. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you again for this Lord's Day morning. We thank you for your love and your grace upon our lives. We pray, Father, that you would meet with us as we seek to draw near to you. May you indeed draw near to us, and may we hear your voice in your word, and may indeed, O oh God, you help us uh, to pursue wisdom in our lives and to avoid great folly in our lives. I pray, Father, that you'd use this time to glorify your Son, to edify your saints, and to evangelize those who are not yet Christians, and that for the glory of the Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, this week, the Sentinel reported a local news story in which a customer from McDonald's discovered a rather large uh, insect in their chicken sandwich. The lady's husband said, it turned out there was a bug in her burger. That's when I stopped eating. Well, you would, wouldn't you? No one wants to find an insect in their food. And yet it's just one little creature in an otherwise perfectly acceptable meal. For that couple, the presence of the insect ruined the enjoyment of their food. Solomon says the same thing about folly. A person may have a very fine reputation, but then they surrender to one act of folly, one moment of madness, like the prodigal son leaving home, or like a foolish word such as Nabal's comment when he rebuffed David's army, or a moment of sexual compromise like David with Bathsheba. And what? The entire reputation of that individual comes tumbling down. The picture Solomon paints is of dead flies that cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savour. Set before us is an image of an ancient perfumer who has mixed a bottle of beautiful scent, but the sweet smell of his perfume has attracted some flies which have, have subsequently gone into the liquid and drowned and sank to the bottom. The fly is a small and insignificant creature, but the addition of the rotting insect bodies alters the entire compound to render the perfume unusable. You know, that is how it is in the Christian life, friends. You may have built up the most wonderful testimony. People may know you as an upstanding believer. They may know you as someone who really loves the Lord and someone who is really committed to the things of the Lord. But in an unguarded moment, you give in to some folly and your testimony is in tatters. This chapter then speaks to us about guarding your life against the destruction of folly. Now at first glance, chapter 10 appears to be, if you were to read it through all the way, a, a seemingly uh, unrelated list of Proverbs. But when you dig deeper, you find there is a central theme that ties them all together. And uh, the theme that sets this chapter uh, before us uh, is, is that of folly. In chapter 9, we saw the recurrence of the word wisdom. But here in chapter 10, the recurring words are folly, foolishness, and full. Nine times in all will you read in this chapter of folly. 
And by way of introduction, Solomon reminds us that wisdom and folly rest in the heart. He says in verse 2, a wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart is at the left. You know, in the culture of the times, the right hand was associated with glory and power and honor, and the left hand was associated with that which was evil. You see, you can, you can pick this up in Scripture. Indeed, all the way through Scripture, you see this idea played out. For example, when Jacob was blessing the sons of Joseph, he crossed his arms much to Joseph's displeasure so as to give the greater blessing to the younger son Ephraim and the lesser blessing to his brother Manasseh. When Solomon's mother came into his palace to visit him, he drew up a chair and set her by the right side of his throne, thereby honoring her. Uh, the Bible says in Exodus chapter 15 and verse 6, Thy right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. Under the law, a priest would administer the blood of a sacrifice with his right hand. The Lord Jesus, we know, sits at the right hand of his Father until that day when he returns in glory. But from there, presently, he advocates for us. In Psalm 16 and verse 8, we read, I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. And again in Psalm 121, we read, The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. So the right hand is viewed as a hand of blessing, as a hand of glory, as a hand of power, as a place of protection in the very presence of God himself. The left hand, however, is, of course, the complete opposite and is associated with abasement and is associated with, uh, with judgment and is associated with evil. For example, in Matthew chapter 25, we read of the judgment of the nations and we read, The Lord shall separate them one from another as a, sheep divide, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats and he shall set the sheep on his right hand but the goats on his left hand. In fact, the very word sinister is the Latin word for to the left or for the left. And so the, we draw this idea from the culture of the time that the left hand is somehow inherently evil and the right hand is somehow good and blessed. So in essence, in verse 2, a wise man's heart is led aright, whereas the foolish man's heart is led astray. That's the idea. And you don't have to be a genius to see that, nor even to identify someone who lives that way. Look at verse 3. He says, Yea, also, when he that is a fool walketh by the way, his wisdom feeleth him, and he saith to everyone that he is a fool. Have you ever seen someone walking down the street and you know they have a they have a certain swagger a certain gait as they're walking down the street and they think they look ever so clever and ever so cool and as you're passing them by you think to yourself my my what an idiot what a, what a twit he looks you know they're full of it and uh you know you, you maybe you say to your your companion of him look at look at your man look at this did you see the state of that fella that's what solomon is saying a fool is not often hard to spot. His very walk gives him away. Now, there are four characteristics of a fool that are laid out before us in this chapter. And the first of those we discover in verses 4 to 7, where we see a fool is lifted up with pride. A fool is lifted up with pride. Look in verse 4. It says, if the spirit of the ruler rise up against thee, leave not thy place, for yielding pacifieth great offenses. There is an evil which I have seen under the sun, as an error which proceedeth from the ruler. Folly is set in great dignity, and the rich sit in low place. I have seen servants upon horses, and princes walking as servants upon the earth. Now Solomon, of course, was a king. 
And as a king, he knew a thing or two about leadership. And he had seen some things in the course of his working life that had set him to thinking. And one of those was when a ruler tears strips off some underling and belittles him in the course of his work. If the spirit of the ruler rise up against thee, it says, leave not thy place for yielding pacifieth great offenses. And in this verse, the ruler is expressing his displeasure with his employee in a, in a very angry manner. He is, a, he is speaking to him in a sinful way. In fact, the word offenses there appears 33 times in the Hebrew Scriptures, and 30 of those times it's translated as a term for sin. So this leader is out of order. He is behaving sinfully toward his underling. He has allowed his position to go to his head. And so he's not treating those beneath him with dignity and with respect. Have you ever met someone like that? Someone who through pride abused their power? You know, maybe somebody is given a uniform and it transforms their personality. Or someone is given a, given a position and it changes their character. Maybe even someone is voted in church to be a deacon or an elder and it transforms them in a negative way. So any person can give in to this. It could be your boss. It could be a teacher. It could even be a pastor, possibly even a parent. And so it's possible for those who are in a position of authority to speak in a way to those beneath them that is unkind and disrespectful and sinful. I remember when I was a young draftsman that I had spent two years with uh, two of my friends, my, my fellow draftsmen, in a vocational college. And uh, we'd spent two years living on a pittance, literally living on a pittance, hardly getting anything at all while we were studying and preparing to be, to be uh, filtered into the main drawing office and to get a job. But the deal was that once you completed those two years and you went into the drawing office and you began to produce productive drawings, that you would get a substantial pay raise. Well, myself, my two friends went into this drawing office and we worked there for about a year or so and there was no indication of a pay raise. And one day my two friends came to me and they said, listen, why don't you, uh, why don't you come with us and uh, go in to see our boss and uh, you can represent us. You know, you're, you're very good at speaking. Why don't you go in and represent us and, uh, and say to him, you know, that we would like to have a review of our pay and we'd like to have that pay raise that is part of our contract. So we did just that. We knocked on the boss's door one day and we asked if we could speak to him. Now, he was a very arrogant character. He was a very difficult man, and not just with us, but with all of the staff. He was a, a very mean-spirited individual. And so we went into his office, and uh, he said, yes, how can I help you? And I said, well, we'd, we'd like to speak to you for a few moments. We'd like to talk to you about perhaps getting our pay raise. And he smiled very kindly, and he said, shut the door. And so we shut the door, and he stood up, and he had a pencil in his hand, and he flung the pencil down. It bounced off the desk, went flying over our heads. We had to duck, and he began to scream at us. He says, listen, I don't negotiate anything with junior draftsmen. Get out! Well, that didn't go very well. And that's the kind of thing that Solomon is speaking about. You see, you're tempted in that moment to react in a certain way, to respond in respect to the treatment that you've been given. You want to tell him what he can do with his job, where he can go. You're tempted to swing around and, and, and just go out the door and slam the door behind you. In other words, you're tempted in that moment to meet fire with fire, to match his pride with your pride. But Solomon says... Leave not thy place. He says, don't leave your position if you find yourself in this set of circumstances. Why? Because you're the one, ultimately, who will lose out. The king will still be the king. The boss will still be the boss. The employer will still be the employer. He says, you're the one who's going to miss out. You're the one who's going to act in folly. You see, it will certainly feel good for the first five minutes when you walk out that door and you slam it behind you and you tell them what's what and you pack your bags and you storm out and you leave the office. Sure, it's going to feel good. For five minutes, it's going to feel good. It might even feel good when you're driving down the road away from the place. But as you approach your home and you have to speak to your, your spouse about it, 
And then payday comes around, and there's no pay for you, and there's no prospect of work, perhaps. Well, now you don't feel so good. Now you realize that you're out of work. Only a fool slams the door on a good job as a matter of pride. Then Solomon made another observation, and again, it is an abuse of power. He notices that sometimes, owing to nepotism or favoritism, someone who is totally unsuited to a position is offered a high-ranking post, whilst people who are able to do something of good in that position, here labeled as the rich, well, they are passed by. A good example of this is found in the book of Esther where you read the story of a man by the name of Haman. Haman is, is promoted to second in command in the Persian kingdom. He's a wicked man. He's a foolish man in the true sense of the word. And each day he comes in to work. He uh, rides into the palace at Shushan, and he expects everyone to bow before him. And everyone does dutifully that, except for one man, Mordecai the Jew, who stands as straight as a tent pole. Now, Mordecai is the man that should probably have been promoted in the land, but was passed over. And you read the story of Esther, and you read the, the account of Haman and of his, uh, of his particular actions, and you ask yourself, how in the world did a fellow like that get into that position? You know, have, I wonder if you ever, ever thought that way. If you ever looked at someone and thought, how did he get that place? How did he get that post? How did he get in that position? You know, maybe you thought that about some of our politicians, about government ministers even. You know, you've watched them on television and you thought to yourself, this, this guy's an idiot. And you wonder what they saw in him to make him the minister of this or the minister of that. And you question the wisdom of the government. It happens all the time. And you know what? It happens all over the world. When foolish and proud men rule, there ends up being social upheaval in the land. And in the story of Esther, there's a rather humorous account of how in the providence of God this upheaval is momentarily overturned and set right for once as you see the man who should be placed in a position of authority honored and the man who is in the position of authority humbled. Look at Esther chapter 6 for a moment and verse 4. Understand at this point what has happened is the king has had a restless night. And in, the, uh, in his sleeplessness, he has called for the chronicles of his kingdom, the records of his kingdom. And he's reading those. I guess he's hoping by reading such a tedious document, he might be put to sleep. And so he, uh, he's reading those documents, and he discovers that there was a plot upon his life, and that his life was saved by Mordecai the Jew. And he inquires as to what dignity had been given, what honor had been given to Mordecai. And he discovered that there had been an injustice in that Mordecai. Mordecai had not been acknowledged for his loyalty to the king. And in verse 4 it says, The king said, Who is in the court? Now Haman was come into the outward court of the king's house to speak unto the king to hang Mordecai, whom he hated, on the gallows that he had prepared for him. In other words, he was intent on murdering this man, but he wanted to do it with the king's stamp of approval. And the king's servants said unto him, Behold, Haman standeth in the court. And the king said, Let him come in. So Haman came in. And the king said unto him, What shall be done unto the man whom the king delights to honor? Now Haman thought in his heart, To whom would the king delight to do honor more than to myself? You know, you've you, you got you to admire his his pride, his, his self-confidence there. You know, he's, he's so full of himself. You know, it's going to honor somebody. It's going to be me. Obviously, I'm the guy that they, they want to honor, honor. And so Haman answered the king, For the man whom the king delighteth to honor, let the royal apparel be brought which the king useth to wear, and the horse that the king rideth upon, and the crown royal which is set upon his head. And let this apparel and horse be delivered to the hand of one of the king's most noble princes, 
that they may array the man with all whom the king delighteth to honor and bring him on horseback through the street of the city and proclaim before him. Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delighteth to honor. Man, he had it all thought out. Haman thought, you know what? If he's going to honor me, if, if I'm going to get some kind of reward here, I'm going for the whole ball of wax. I want everything. I want the king's robes. I want the king's horse. I want a runner in front of me. I, I want the crowds to come out and cheer me. I want people to acknowledge my brilliance, to acknowledge my power. And the king thought it was a marvelous suggestion. Verse 10. Then the king said to Haman, Make haste and take the apparel and the horse as thou hast said, and do even so to Mordecai the Jew that sitteth at the king's gate. Let nothing fail of all that thou hast spoken. And you can imagine how crestfallen uh, Haman must have been in that day. But he epitomizes the foolish person who is lifted up with pride. But notice, secondly, a fool is lacking in perception in verse 8. He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it. And whoso breaketh in hedge, a serpent shall bite him. And whoso removeth stones shall be hurt therewith. And he that cleaveth wood shall be endangered thereby. If the iron be blunt and he do not wet the edge, then must he put to more strength. But wisdom is profitable to direct. Surely the serpent will bite without enchantment, and a babbler is no better. Now, at first glance, those few verses read like some kind of ancient health and safety manual. You know, a man digs a hole and he falls into his own hole. Another man cuts through a hedge and he doesn't think that there may be some danger there, perhaps a, 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 snake's, a snake's nest, and, and so he pushes through the, the hedge and he gets bitten. A third man is demolishing a wall. Evidently, he's not dealt how to do this correctly, and the stones fall upon his head, and he's hurt. A fourth man is exhausted trying to chop wood because he hasn't bothered to sharpen his axe. And lastly, you have a snake charmer who gets bit by his own serpent because he doesn't charm in time. Well, is Solomon really telling us here to take care at work? Is this really about health and safety? You know, all of this would be good advice, but remember that the Bible is a spiritual book. And so what seems to be on the surface a series of rather obvious exhortations is actually telling us something else. And the common denominator with each of those cases is that in every proverb, the man in question seems to be oblivious to the danger that he's in. You see, a fool may prove to be his own worst enemy. We see that again in the ongoing struggle between Haman and Mordecai in the book of Esther. You know, as I mentioned, Haman was seeking Mordecai's life. He was like the man in verse 8 of Ecclesiastes 10 who was digging a, a pit, a, a hole, and fell into his own pit, into his own hole. In fact, the book of Psalms uh, likens such a thing and uses such a thing as an analogy of someone who is trying to trip up another. He's digging a hole in the hope that someone else will fall in, but he ends up being the one who falls in. In Psalms chapter 7 and verses 15 and 16, it says, He made a pit and digged it, and has fallen into the ditch which he had made. His mischief shall return upon his own head, and his violent dealings shall come down upon his own pit. Again in chapter 9 and verse 15, The heathen are sunk down into the pit that they made. In the net which they hid is their own foot taken. The Lord is known by the judgment which he executeth. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. Higion Salah. So Haman, he builds these gallows. He takes it upon himself to build gallows. He goes down to Shushan's B&Q and he gets all the wood and all the screws and all the bolts and everything he needs and he comes back home and he erects a huge gallows in his garden and he's excited at the prospect of hanging Mordecai, doing to death his arch enemy. And as we've just seen, he goes skipping into the palace to get the approval of the king that particular day. 
When the king, far from wanting to hang Mordecai, actually wants to honor Mordecai. Now watch what happens next in chapter 7. In chapter 7, Haman is revealed as an enemy of the Jewish people. And he is exposed as someone who's intent on destroying the queen herself, Queen Esther, who is a Jewess. And so in, in verse 6, at a banquet, Esther said, the adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. Understand that the King Ahasuerus and Haman and Esther were in a private banquet with each other. And so she points to Haman and she points him out as the enemy. Then Haman was afraid before the king and the queen. And the king, arising from the banquet of wine in his wrath, went into the palace garden. And Haman stood up to make requests for his life to Esther the queen. For he saw that there was evil determined against him by the king. He knew by the king's face that the outcome was not going to be good for him. Then the king returned out of the palace garden into the place of the banquet of wine. And Haman was fallen upon the bed wherein Esther was. So you can imagine the queen is lying on her chaise lounge. She's got, you know, she's just relaxing here because she knows her husband is going to deal with the problem. Haman has been pacing the room. He's been appealing to the queen. She's not surrendering to his, uh, his uh, cry for mercy. And finally he grabs her by the ankles and he's holding on to her when the king comes back into the room. Verse 8, then the king returned out of the palace garden into the place of the banquet of wine, and Haman was fallen upon the bed wherein Esther was. Then said the king, will he force the queen also before me in the house? Is it not bad enough that he wants to kill her? Now he's going to molest her as well. And as the word went out of the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. And Harbona, one of the chamberlains, said before the king, Behold also the gallows fifty cubits high, which Haman had made for Mordecai, who had spoken good to the king, standeth in the house of Haman. Then the king said, Hang him thereon. You get the impression that Harbona had some kind of, uh, some kind of beef with uh, Haman. But he didn't like him any better than anyone else. You know, uh, how he, look at how he, how he puts it. You know, hey, hey, uh, your majesty, you remember that nice guy, Mordecai? You remember the guy that you reward, rewarded a few days ago who got to, tra got to travel through town on your horse and wearing your robe and all the rest of it? That guy that saved your life, you remember him? Yes. Well, uh, Haman has built a, a rather large set of gallows, 75 feet high in his back garden that he was hoping to hang Mordecai on. Uh, perhaps that might help. And so verse 10, they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then was the king's wrath pacified. pacified. You see, a fool rarely sees the danger in his own actions and can be his own worst enemy and often becomes a victim of his own folly. So a fool is someone who's lifted up with pride, someone who's lacking in perception. But notice now in verse 12 of our text in Ecclesiastes 10, a fool loves to posture. He loves to posture. It says the words of a wise man in verse 12, the words of a wise man's mouth are gracious, but the lips of a fool will swallow up himself. The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is mischievous madness. A fool also is full of words. A man cannot tell him what shall be, and what shall be after him. Who can tell him? The labor of the foolish wearieth every one of them, because he knoweth not how to go to the city. Here's a man who is opinionated. Here's a man who likes the sound of his own voice. Here's a man who likes to sound off. He dominates every conversation. He is, in the words of Scripture, full of words. You know, that is all he has to offer is words. Here's a man who acts like he knows everything, but actually he couldn't find his way into the heart of the city if he tried. He couldn't even manage to find his way down the main road if you set it in front of him. That's what Solomon says. And so all he has to offer is words. No more, no less. Yes, he's like a bass drum. He's all sound, but he's completely hollow. Someone once said that wise men speak because they have something to say, but fools because they have to say something. From beginning to end, this man talks absolute nonsense. 
But no one can actually convince him of that. No one can tell him what shall be. No one can tell him what shall be after him. What would be the consequence of his proposals? He is so self-assured. He is so disparaging of other people's opinions. He is so disrespectful of other people that he just carries on talking over the top of them. There's only one thing that can stop a fellow like that. And Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 6 gives it to us. Listen to what it says. Proverbs 18 and 6 it says a fool's lip entereth into contentions and his mouth calleth for strokes the bible says the only thing that would stop a fellow like that is a punch in the mouth now of course that's hyperbole we're never expected to strike anyone in that way and even if we did you know it would it would do nothing to stop such a one he's absolutely irrepressible look in the chapter 27 and 22 of proverbs where it says this though thou shouldest bray a fool in a mortar among wheat with a pestle yet will not his foolishness depart from him i love that image you know we've all seen a, a, a cook using a mortal and pestle to grind up spices or whatever is in there you know you have this heavy weight uh heavy weight um, tool and you're pounding in the on the uh, grain or whatever it is you have trying to turn it into dust effectively or into little particles and the idea is if you threw a fool in there and you just pounded him to death if you pounded him and grind him into little particles still his foolishness would not depart from him again look in verse 13 of chapter 10 it says that the beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness and the end of his talk is mischievous madness from beginning to end, he speaks nonsense. The word mischievous actually is worse than nonsense. It's often translated with the word evil. In fact, that's what you see in verse 5. There is an evil, same Hebrew word, which I've seen under the sun. There's a mischief which I've seen under the sun, says Solomon. And the idea here is not just of someone who speaks nonsense, but of someone who is actually malicious in their words. And we have a perfect example of that in the New Testament, in the book of 3 John, in a local church context, where we meet a fellow who is, in every sense, a fulfillment of, of Solomon's words, a man by the name of Diotrephes in verses 9 and 10. And John says, I wrote unto the church, 3 John and 9, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, look, he's lifted up with pride, receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church prodding against us with malicious words, speaking nonsense, making false accusations. You know, I'm sorry to say there are people like that in the churches sometimes. People who love the sound of their own voice, or people who covet positions of power, people who try to shoehorn and bully others into doing things their way, in acting a certain way. Well, let me tell you, we can't have that. We can't have that kind of individual governing us. We can't permit that kind of individual to have influence over us. We must deal with someone if there are diatrophies in our midst. We must tell them that their ways are sinful and wrong. And if needs be, we may need to even discipline them from the membership. By contrast, a Christian's tone is to be gracious. Look at verse 12 of Ecclesiastes 10. The words of a wise man's mouth are gracious. Words are really important. Philip Ryken comments here, words have the power to help us get what we want. We use them to get a laugh, to get attention, or to get someone to do something for us. We use words to get a job or to get a girl or a guy, as the case may be. We use words to build ourselves up and tear other people down. But do we use words as instruments of grace? Do we speak for the good of others or as a way of achieving our own agenda? Well, what a challenge. Are we using our words for the good of others? Or are we simply using words to manipulate others as a way of achieving our own goals and our own agenda? A Christian is to speak with grace. 
He's not to be motivated by self in that way. You know, in Psalm 45, and this is a messianic psalm, and Psalm 45 and verse 2, it says, Thou art fairer, speaking of the Lord Jesus, thou art fairer than the children of men. Grace is poured into thy lips. Therefore God hath blessed thee forever. In, psalm, in, in the book of Luke, in the gospel of Luke, in chapter 4, we have a commentary on the words of the Lord Jesus and on the graciousness of them. In chapter 4 and verse 22 it says, And all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And you and I are to emulate that characteristic. We are to manifest Christ in that way in our own lives. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29 we read this, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of the edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And again in Colossians, in chapter 4 and verse 6, you find a similar command. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Not necessarily what you ought to answer. We don't always know what to say, but we all, always ought to know how we should say it. We should say it with grace. Paul Tripp addresses this matter in his book, War of Words in which he gives some very practical guidelines to tell the difference between wise words and, gra and gracious words and those that are foolish and sinful. He says this, listen to the talk that goes on in your home. How much of it is impatient and unkind? How often are words spoken out of selfishness and personal desire? How easily do outbursts of anger occur? How often do we bring up past wrongs? How do we fail to communicate hope? How do we fail to protect? How often do our words carry threats that we've had it and are about to quit? Stop and listen. And you will see how much we need to talk to this standard of love and how often the truth we profess to speak is distorted by our sin. So a fool is lifted up with pride. And the fool is lacking in perception. And the fool loves to posture. And finally, in verse 16 through 20, we see that a fool lives for privilege. Woe to thee, O land, when thy king is a child, and thy princes eat in the morning. Blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles, and the princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. By much slothfulness the building decayeth, and through idleness of the hands the house droppeth through. A feast is made for laughter, and wine maketh merry, but money answereth all things. Curse not the king, no, not in thy thought, and curse not the rich in thy bedchamber, for a bird of the air shall carry the voice, and that which hath wings shall tell the matter. Now verse 16 warns us against putting novices and those who are immature in high office. Such men will, of course, relish the privileges of their position, and they will abuse the powers which they have been entrusted with, and they will bring ruin to the land. The Bible says, Woe to thee, O land, when thy king is a child. It doesn't mean that he's necessarily young of age, but that he's someone who's immature, someone who is unsuitable to that position, someone like Rehoboam. Do you remember how when Solomon dies, the kingdom passes on to his son Rehoboam, who did the very thing that this chapter speaks against. He put those who, are, were, who should be servants upon horses, upon high places, and those who should have been in high places, he put down the elders of the land. He listened to his younger peers and he put aside the elders and the counselors who had already had experience around Solomon's throne. In other words, he epitomizes this very thing. Woe to the old land when thy king is a child. As a consequence of his immature decisions, Rehoboam split the kingdom. Now such men enjoy the trappings of power, but they are serving themselves. We call them career politicians, men who will put, the, put themselves before their party and their party before the country. 
When we read here of princes that are eating in the morning, it's not speaking of them having breakfast, but it's speaking of them eating to excess. It's, expe- it's speaking of indulgence. And unlike those who are noble, uh, that uh, treat their office with a degree of solemnity, uh, those people do not engage in gluttony and in drunkenness. And those who are, well, what do they do? Well, verse 18, they're destroying the nation, the, the very house by the way they live, by giving scant regard to the matters of state, whilst enjoying the high life they bring, uh, they, they bring the nation to ruin. Now, Solomon is not against banqueting. In fact, he says in verse 19 that feasts and banquets have their place. But money answereth all things. And what he means by that is, well, there are people who have enough versatility about them and who have the resources who can actually be useful, who can actually do some good. He says those are the people who should be in power, people who can do some good, not people who are just looking out for themselves, not people who are just enjoying privilege, not people who are just sitting in, in banquets and, and being gluttonous and drunken. And finally, he has one more word of counsel on our talk. He says, Curse not the king, in verse 20, no, not in thy thought, and curse not the rich in thy bedchamber, for a bird of the air shall carry the voice, and and that which hath wings shall tell the matter. It's very easy, isn't it, uh, to speak against and speak ill of those who are over us, whether that's our prime minister, or our government, or our parents, or our teacher, or our pastor, or someone else. But Solomon says, Don't do it. Why? He says, because a bird of the air shall carry the voice. That's where we get the the proverb, a little bird told me from. You know, when somebody tells you something, you say, how do you know that? They say, a little bird told me. It comes right here from the book of Ecclesiastes. And remember this, when you do say things against others, there may be someone who hears, who overhears. Or indeed, if you say something against someone to someone else, remember that the person you're speaking to will also speak about you, that they will happily gossip about you. And those who overhear a matter sometimes like nothing better than scandal, and like nothing better than a whispering campaign, and like nothing better than a bit of gossip. And you, a person who can truly keep a confidence, is really a rare individual. Well, where have we come from? Well, in verses 20, we've, by the time we get there, we've gone from dead flies to little birds. And what a wide range of counsel we have uncovered in between. Proverbs on wisdom, proverbs on leadership, problems, uh, proverbs on industry, danger, discretion, patience, direction, language, and more. Who can say the Bible is not relevant to us today? Solomon has taught us in the previous chapters that death is certain, that life is unpredictable, and now how we can avoid folly and how we may employ wisdom, and the wisdom of God in particular. And like Solomon, the Lord Jesus too addressed the difference between wisdom and folly. Look finally in Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. You see, the Lord Jesus far more succinctly then Solomon summarizes the difference between the wise person and the fool. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 24, he tells this story, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand, or the silt. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, that the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one as having authority, and not as the scribes. What does the Lord Jesus tell us about wisdom and folly? He tells us that true wisdom rests upon the rock. That is, upon his words, upon the word of Christ, upon his person, upon who he is, and ultimately upon his work, upon what he's done for us. You know, at the outset of Ecclesiastes chapter 10, we read that a wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart is at his left. Jesus put it this way. A a wise man's heart is settled upon Christ. 
that a foolish man places his trust in the shifting sands of human opinion. He's a man who is moved by every tide. He's a man who is constantly, uh, constantly uh, being undermined. Everything he says has no substance or no, no uh, foundation. But the man who is trusting in the Word of God, the man who is trusting in the Son of God, the man who's put his trust and his faith in the cross of Christ, well, that man is wise. Have you trusted in Christ? Have you rested your foundation upon the sure rock of Jesus' words? Are you believing the Bible this morning? Or are you following your own way? What does your life say? What does your spirit exhibit? What do people say of you? Do they say, now there's a wise man? Or do they say, there's a fool? Does your life show forth divine wisdom or worldly folly? May God help you this morning to be able to tell the difference. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you today for your holy word. We thank you for the words of Christ upon which we may build our lives. And we thank you, Lord, for the word of God that we've read this morning that has been so relevant and practical in so many areas of our daily lives. Help us, Lord, to apply these things to our lives. But above all, help us today to find our lives grounded and standing upon the truth of Scripture. Lord, if there's someone here today who's not a Christian, someone who is indeed governing their lives by worldly standards and who are believing human opinion about this, about that, about the other, help them today to realize, Lord, that those who are wise put their trust in your word, have their confidence in your Son, and exercise faith in what he did for us on Calvary's cross. Help them to come today to the Savior, acknowledging their sin and believing upon him by faith. But Lord, for your people today, help us examine our own hearts. Are we guilty sometimes of being lifted up with pride? When people speak to us in a proud way, do we respond with pride in turn? Do we fight fire with fire? Lord, help us this morning to think about our words. Do our words show forth graciousness? Or are they filled with folly? Are we full of words? Are we talking irrepressibly, but not really thinking about the things that we're saying? And Lord, help us to be mindful today that even in our language, when we speak to others about others, those people speak to us, to others about us. And Father, help us to be a good confidant. Help us to be someone who can, uh, can keep a truth and not spread it and not... Uh, not sure. And even, Lord, help us to keep our opinions to ourselves, even if those, especially if those opinions are in some way hurtful or unhelpful. So we pray you bless us today, encourage us in our walk as believers, and that for Jesus' sake. Amen. Thank you for listening. Lord willing, we'll see you again tonight at 6 p.m.